humility brings grace. That's what the scripture says. You can read it in John 4, 6. Humility brings grace. I don't know about you, but um, I desire more grace. I need more grace. Amen? That means I'm getting something that I don't even deserve. There's something that God's pouring into my life that I don't even deserve. Whether it's wisdom, whether it's knowledge, whether it's understanding, whatever it is, God's giving me something that I don't even deserve. Right? Isn't that what salvation is? Isn't that why we're saved by grace? Because we really don't deserve it, but he, he gave it to us anyway. Right? Because he loved us. He loved the world so much that he, he gave his only begotten son, right? That who should ever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? Because it's all about the Father, right? We're here to glorify our Father. And I want us to Jump back in the word about humility because we've been in the midst of humility. And if you have your Bibles, turn to James 4, 7 through 10. It says, therefore, submit to God. We've talked about submit. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We've talked about resist. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We've talked about drawing near. Amen. Amen. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to what? Gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Amen. We talked last week and we talked about what? Clean hands, right? We talked about your heart as well, right? But before that, we talked about drawing near to God because it says in the scripture, if I draw near to him, he's going to draw near to me. And I challenge you, are we drawing near to him? Are we drawing closer to him each and every day? Are we drawing closer to him in prayer? Is our hands aligned with our heart? Because that's kind of where we left off, right? About the hands and about the heart. And, and it, it, too many times as Christians, we, our hands are sometimes good, but then our heart is not uh, aligned with, with the goodness within our, our hands. And, and too many times our, our heart is good in an area, but then we're doing the, uh, you know, it's kind of like what Paul says. I do the things that I don't want to do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. You know, he, he has it all kind of mixed up. Kind of, I think my name should have been there instead of Paul's, Right? I, I think I could put my name. Instead of Paul, I'll just put my name. Lord, the things that I need to be doing, man, I, I, I just seem to blow it. But everything I'm, I'm, I'm doing, uh, it's like it, I'm not supposed to, and, and what I need to do, I'm not doing, and I just, man, it's just a big messed up thing. But I left off right there that if our hands are not equal to our heart, it's really double-minded, Right? Because if my hands are out doing good, but really I'm only doing good in the flesh because, you know, I, I just want everybody to see how good and godly I am. Can we be real? How many times have you walked into church and you know you're, you're messed up? You know you want prayer knowing that you, you are just, you know, you're, you're not what you're about to say. Your heart's broken, there's strife, there's hurt, there's worry, there's doubt, there's things that's going on. But someone asks you, a brother or sister comes up, how are you doing? Oh man, I'm just all whole blessed. Hallelujah, praise God, Chaka Khan, and everything else, right? No one knows how to help you, but then you'll leave. Man, they don't pray, they don't care. They, well, you said everything was fine. It's double-minded, right? Even in that instances we're adding the church but it's double-minded anytime a lie comes out that's not in the heart it's double-minded right a lie shouldn't be in your heart either but your hands should be equal to your heart your heart should be equal to your hands that's where james gets the works with faith let me see your faith by your works because what produces the what what comes out of these hands should be something that is aligned with the word of God because that's where your heart should be, right? And anything that doesn't equal, it's double-minded. And that's where we're going to jump in today is we're going to talk about the double-minded. And unfortunately, we're not talking about double-minded individuals that's unbeliever because really the word doesn't apply to those, in, those individuals in all cases, right? Well, pastor, I don't know about that. Doesn't the word apply to everyone? Well, yeah, technically, but I can't expect someone that doesn't know Jesus to be really changed, Right? I can't expect them to, to, to really know all of his ways to truly follow him. It, he, I'm putting more on him than what that I should, right? Maybe if we as Christians illuminated the glory of God more, 
maybe those individuals would desire to have more of God. And then at that time when they come to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, then I can discuss with them as another brother, you know what, what you're doing is not really lined up with the word of God. I don't think Jesus is really happy. I can help you. We can pray through this. We can pick up each other's burdens because right there what you're doing is a double-minded individual. And that's what's hurtful to the church that's what's hurtful to the body of christ is we have christians that's double-minded i love the lord i love the lord lord does everything lord is everything but i just saw you at the strip joint yesterday well how'd you see me well you know what i was driving by my wife and i and my kids and we were all hiding our eyes and you were right there or i saw you on facebook or i saw you this or i heard something that came out of your mouth you say you trust in the lord but then everything that comes out of your mouth is nothing but negative I can't, I'm not going to do this. This isn't going to be successful. It's double-minded. Can we be honest with ourselves? Let's take a deep breath. (sighs) Okay, let's take a deep breath because we we need to discuss this, right? And half of you aren't even taking a deep breath. There you go. First thing we need to do about double-minded is we need to define it, right? It is a state of being torn between two opposing thoughts, desires, or beliefs. It is an eternal conflict that divides our focus and commitment making it difficult for us to make wholehearted decisions. Do you see where it, it's two things that's, that's interacting? I, I'm trying to lean towards this, but I'm trying to lean towards this, and, and one's right and one's wrong, or, or one's just the opposite of what, what I'm saying I'm confessing. I, I, I believe in Jesus, and I believe in this, but my mouth is just filthy. My mouth is, and I'm not trying to do anything about it. Oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus, but then, then I'm watching things that I shouldn't be watching. I'm going to movies that I shouldn't be going. I, I'm not praying like I, I said I would pray for the individual, I already forgot about the individual. I I want my life to be changed. I want humility. I want to be humble before God because I want more of his grace. Because I need more of his grace every day that that I'm out in my workplace. I need his grace in the midst of my marriage. I need his grace in the midst of raising my children. I need his grace in the midst of this economy because I do not live by this economy. I live by God's economy. And I need the grace of God in order to get me through this. Amen? Amen. So I think we need to develop humility. So it's a state of being torn between two things. It even continues to say the state of being torn between two opposing thoughts or desires hinders our spiritual growth and undermines our ability to trust in God wholeheartedly. That's what double-minded means. That means it's going to affect my trust in God. So since we have the definition, let's talk about the biblical perspective. The Bible warns us about the dangers of double-mindedness. James 1, 5 through 8. If any, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. Do you see that? Let him ask in faith with no what? Doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. How many times do we go to God as a double-minded man? Unstable. We get on our knees. Lord, I need this, I need this. But then we question. I don't even know how you're going to do it. I don't see how, that ain't going to happen in my life. Do you see, see our double-mindedness? You see what's in our heart, our desires, that we really want to please God, but then then we go out and we do just the opposite. Let me use this example. Has anybody ever wanted to lose weight? Am I the only one that ever wanted to lose weight? I'm the only one that's been big, swollen. My whole life has been like swelled and and de-swelled and swelled. You know, it's not even a word, but you know, you get my point, right? My heart, I want to lose weight. But when you catch me with a bag of Oreos, it says something different, right? When the hot sign's on, you can't blame it on the car, amen? I got to confess, yesterday was my cheat day. So I had a piece of cheesecake because we took Joshua out because it was his birthday. He wanted to go to Cheesecake Factory and go and do some shopping. And, and then on the way home, I figured, hey, since it's my splurge day, let's just go buy Krispy Kreme. Hot sign wasn't on, but that didn't stop me. But I want to lose weight, so I'm exercising. Do you see where it's aligning with what's in my heart? 
I'm going to watch what I eat, but there's going to be a splurge day. I love the Lord, but I have to make sure that, that I'm walking a lifestyle that aligns with my faith, my commitment, what I spoke, that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, so now my lifestyle needs to align. We have the hands and we have the heart. They need to align. So if my heart is confessing the Lord Jesus, that means my hands need to be an example of the Lord Jesus. It doesn't need to be double-minded. But we see here that a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways, right? Is there a, a, a point in your life, a, a situation in your life, a, a, a thought or a work or anything that is unstable in your life? Do you have a relationship that's unstable? That's important right there. Let's just stop there. Do you have a relationship that you can't be truthful in? Someone asks you something, but you just do a little lie, a little fib, because who knows how it's going to be blown out? That's double-minded. It's unstable. It will not stand. There's division in the midst of that marriage if it's double-minded. There's a division, double-minded in the midst of a relationship if another sister can't say, you know what, that dress doesn't just, it's ugly. Right? It's ugly. And that makeup, I don't know what you're trying to do, but, you know, it, it ain't working either. I'm about to put you out in a cornfield and put you on, you know, because it ain't. Right? But in the same tone, we should be able to come along and say, man, that's a beautiful dress. Man, it, it, we should have just as much encouragement as we have, you know, as correction, right? My God encourages me more than he ever corrects me. Humility brings grace, Right? How about a brother, so-and-so, that you know someone is going through something, but you refuse? How about when you're asked a question, and, and, and you don't properly answer it? You basically lie. That's what happens within marriages. A double-minded marriage is unstable. We have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to communicate in every relationship. That means there's a part that you talk, and there's a part that you listen. That's communication. Communication, we think, oh, I just, blah, 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 blah. No, there's a part that you just shut this. And you listen. There's a reason why God gave you two ears. In marriage counseling, that's the first thing I do. I tell everyone, this is the first thing you do. You're going to take 30 minutes a day. 15 minutes, one of you is going to talk and the other is going to listen. The other 15 minutes, you're swapping. Now what happens is usually the, they come back the second week and I find the one did all the talking on the 30 minutes and the other one just yes, yes, yes. Amen? And I'm not going to say who did the talking. All I know in Revelation, it says there's a half an hour of silence. But it's double-minded not to tell the truth. If you have a good relationship, you should be able to tell the truth. Why do you say that, Pastor? Is because too many times we come in our prayer closet, busted, angry, broke, upset with God, and we, oh, Lord, just thank you. Oh, he, that's not a relationship with the Lord. The Lord wants your anger. He wants your hate. He wants your problems. He wants everything. He's the only one that you can come to. Busted, broken, disgusted, and angry with him. And you leave fully filled with the Holy Ghost. Fully okay. Knowing that he has you. Knowing that you're loved. Knowing that he's not going to disown you. I've come to the Lord several times angry. He's the only one that knows how to deal with it. He's the only one that knows how to correct it. He's the only one that knows how to deal with it. So I can walk out of that room knowing that I... I have been corrected, but I've been loved at the same time. We got to stop being double-minded. Let me just say it again. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. How many things do you not have that you've been praying in faith because you've wavered? You've doubted. Double-minded. We come to the Lord and then we question, I don't know how you're going to do this. This mountain's a little bit too big. Do you, do you really think anything's too big for the Lord? Do you really think anything's too small? Do you see how we evaluate our prayers? We're talking to God. Nothing's too small, nothing's too big. It's just a problem. There's no, there's no significance to anything. Whether it's cancer, whether it's a financial problem, whether it's a job you need, it, it, it's, it's not a big deal for God. Well, God, this is a big one. It's not a big one for God. Here, here we're talking to the creator of all. We need to stop being double-minded and, and stop coming to God. That, you know, I got a big one for you. I don't know about you now, Lord. Well, this one's too small for you. you know, no, no, it's not too small. He loves all of them because there's nothing too small or too big. He's God. 
We need to come and know he's God and stand on the word of God and know in faith that we can have whatever we ask according to his will and I'm not going to be a double-minded. I'm not going to be in the ocean tossed back and forth. If he said that I can be delivered, that means I can be delivered. That means he can give me the strength for this deliverance. That means I don't have to have these strongholds. I don't have to have this generational curse. I don't have to bondage. I don't have to have this mindset. I can take these things captive. I don't have to live like this because I'm a child of God. We can't waver. Double-minded spiritually will always lead to a double-minded life outwardly. Think about that for a minute. We're just talking about the biblical perspective. A double-minded mindset, spirit, will always manifest a double-minded life outwardly. That means you're going to be unstable. That means you're going to have a trust issues, just not with God, but with your spouse. Isn't that double-minded? I trust you, and I'm going to marry you, but then you're all full of jealousy. Because jealousy says just the opposite. When you said, I do, I trust, and everything else, jealousy says just the opposite. Are you double-minded? That's why we have to get help for jealousy, right? That's why we have to understand that, that you know, that's, just, that's a spirit that we don't need to hold on to. All fear. Man, I trust in the Lord with all my heart. And, but uh, uh, I don't know whether to do this, right, because we're shaken. There's a difference between shaken and still trusting and having the faith in God than not having the faith and trust in God. What would our lives look like if we removed the double-mindedness? This instability arises from our inability to fully commit to God's will. Right? That's what double-minded really is. It's our desires. It's us seeking our will, right? Which hinders our spiritual growth, right? How about our emotions and our feelings? Our desires. How many times have they become the absolute truth? And as any time that our emotions and our feelings becomes the absolute truth, then we're already double-minded. Because if I believe in Jesus Christ, that means, you know what, I'm going to follow his commandments. That means this whole word is nothing but absolute truth. This is the moral standard. This is the moral truth. This is absolute truth. There is nothing else. Well, how can you say that? Because you know what? This word created the universe. This word created everything else. This word created time that we live in. God does not live in time. Do you think God really lives by gravity? He doesn't live by gravity. He walked on the water. If we just keep our eyes on him, we will never have to worry about gravity because we'll walk on water. It's our faith. We have to have the faith not being double-minded, not being trusting in God, but then I trust in the waves and the wind. I choose to keep my eyes focused on God. We need to stop becoming double-minded. The church, everybody has become double-minded that we don't see the power of God. That's why the five-fold ministry is not activated. Well, you know, I believe God can heal. Well, go lay hands on him. Well, you know that, uh, what? Well, I'm believing God because I need this provision. And you know what? Well, you're believing God for the $100 electric bill, but you're not believing God for the $1,700 mortgage? How much more faith does it take to believe him for $100 or $100,000? It doesn't take no difference in faith, does it? Because we have a God that's able, right? We have a God that's able. But we start trusting our desires, our emotions, our feelings. And then, then we start looking at the waves. We start looking at the wind. And, and then we start taking our eyes off of Jesus. And then we're double-minded. I'm proclaiming him, but I'm looking somewhere else. The problem is, is our heart sometimes will confess. But then our hands are completely living a different lifestyle. Oh, I trust in the Lord. Are you? You work the first four hours of work to try to get out of the last four hours. That doesn't sound like a, man, a godly man. Right? I had mechanics that worked for me and, and salesmen and all kinds of people. And I had some of those individuals. And you set them in. And, man, you work hard. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. The first four hours of the day. Trying to get out of the last four. Now, if you want time off, I, I give you time. Some of the best salesmen know exactly that. You know what? They, they, they know when to work. And they know when not to work. What I mean by that is I had an incredible salesman that I knew. He would work. He would work whatever hours. But then he, every, once in a while, he would take a Thursday off, a Friday off. You wouldn't even see him. But he was the number one salesman. He knew he would never be productive whenever he, he just wasn't in that zone. But he gave more to the company than anybody else. 
And when I looked at his hours, he actually worked more hours than anybody else. But that's double-minded to commit to something and then defraud in the midst of it, right? You agree to this job, but now we want to ne- renegotiate it in the midst of the job. Just quit the job instead of you know, being double-minded, if that's what it takes. Or just go ahead and put up with it and realize that you're doing it for God. How many things have you ever done that you, you really didn't want to do? Uh, there's plenty of things. There's plenty of things I've served, whether it's in church, whether it's in the world, whether it's in life, whether it's through business. There's plenty of things I didn't want to do. But you know who I was doing it for? I was doing it for God. And because I gave my word to God means I didn't want to be double-minded. That means I agreed to this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make sure it happens because it's between God and I. It's not between you and I. See, if we start volunteering at church and we start making a commitment at church, we start doing it for God, not the pastor, not the pews, not the seats, not anything else, then there will be a difference in church, amen? There will be a difference within our relationship with God. There will be a difference at your workplace. There will be a difference on how you handle relationships. Because I'm doing it to God, not, not to man, not to anybody else. How about Nahum? Wasn't he a little bit double-minded? He wanted a miracle, but he wanted it his way. I know the Lord. Man, I got orders. I'm coming to a prophet. Well, you go dip seven times. Just go dip. What do you mean? Yeah, I got to go dip in the crummiest water. How about David? Was he not double-minded? Oh, man, the Lord. Lord, before you, I've sinned and only before you. I love you and I worship you. But, man, that balcony trip really kind of messed him up, didn't it? It's human. It's human nature, isn't it? We can all fall, right? But we repent and we come back, Right? That's not an excuse to justify it, amen? But you see where you could be double-minded? I serve the Lord, and I'm the, but then we walk out in the balcony. And then it goes a little bit further. Have you ever been in that position? Have you ever had a balcony walk? Oh, I never committed adultery. Well, you know what? Have you ever did anything else that God called you to hear, but then you took the balcony walk and you, you choose a different mountain? You choose a different fight? You choose a different direction? You choose a different path? It didn't work out? How about that saying, I I am in the world, but not of the world? How many times we use that excuse to justify what we're doing, but really, if we really want to be honest with ourselves, we're just double-minded. Well, I, I, yeah, but it, it, was, it was a bad movie, but you know what? I just hummed it whenever I knew they were going to say a bad word. Hum! I mean, you see how silly that is? But when we do things, when we go to places, when we support woke businesses, can I get an amen? Uh, we're going to be real, right? Because double mind is right. I serve the Lord. The Lord is everything. I'm going to walk according to his word. But you know what? I don't think Jesus would show up here and shop. I don't think Jesus would show up here and eat because of what they, they, they represent, right? I don't think Jesus is going to show up at Walt Disney. Can I just say amen? I mean, I, I don't want to offend anybody. I mean, I love Walt Disney just as much. I had season passes years ago. But, I mean, I don't personally think, you know what, they take down the American flags, they put up a pride flag. I don't know about you, but I, I, I like our country. It's under God. It's not under something else. If you want to put an ark on those flags, man, I'm all for you. But I'm not going to be part of, of cultivating something that is absolutely a direct opposite from the word of God. I'm using that as an example. You can throw the stones later. But make sure you throw the stones at the sin, not the sinner. Or the deliverer, I should say. Amen? Amen. But isn't that double-minded? I'm supporting God. Yeah, unfortunately, not every place is going to be Christian. Unfortunately, we don't vote always according to Christian because we have to pick the least of, right? Or the best of the, the worst. I'm just using these as examples. But too many times we could easily say no or not share our support to something that we know is woke and stop using the excuse for it. You guys are quiet. Third item. Third point. Third thing I want to talk about. Double-mindedness and faith. Double-mindedness also affects your faith. Affects your faith. My faith. Our faith. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise of the other. Despise the other. You cannot serve what? God and what? You only have one master, right? If I serve the other, whether it's my hands or whether it's my heart, it's double-minded, right? Double-minded people have divided loyalty between God and the world. That's really what double-minded is, right? And if I've 
divided that between God and the world, where's my faith at? Who's my faith in? I love the Lord. He provided my job. But the job isn't my provider. God is my provider. Do you understand? But how many times we put our faith in our job instead of the one that blessed us? How many times we put our faith in the blessing instead of the blesser? That's why money's everything, right? But how many people love money? It, money's not the problem. It's if, if we have the love of money that's over God. Amen. And many times I have people that, I mean, they're almost put it in their will that, you know what, whenever I die, I need you to pull my money out of the bank and I need you to bury it with me because I love it so much. Well, hell's going to burn it. <laughs> right? It's the love of. And if I'm serving two masters, that means I'm, I'm dividing my love, right? That's what double minded means, right? There's two. Let's go a little bit further. This compromises our faith and weaknesses. It weakens our trust in God. That means it weakens my trust in him healing, trust in providing, trust in salvation. Have you ever wavered your salvation? Or do you know that 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 you know you are saved? Grace. I know that I know, I know, I know, I know, I know that there's more grace upon me than what I deserve because God is so gracious. God is so wonderful. God is so amazing. Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you see that? If I draw near to God, he will draw near to me. And I need to have the faith that he wants to reward. What father in heaven doesn't want to reward his children? I want to reward Joshua every chance I get, every opportunity I can. Not that I want to spoil Brant, not that I want to develop pride, or not that I want to develop enableness. No, I want to develop a, a godly child that knows that whenever he leaves this home, he has a father in heaven where all the blessings came from. It wasn't from mommy or daddy. It was from father, my, our father in heaven and whenever you leave this home he still wants to continue to bless you even in the midst of the furnace he's going to bless you with his presence even in the midst of the lion's den he's going to bless you with some angels that hold the mouth, the mouth shut even in the midst of the valley he said he'll never leave me nor forsake me because he's going to bless each and every one of us and he needs to know that you need to know that that's faith and that's faith and trust in God what does it say in the Shema Shema Israel, Adonai Elohino, Adonai Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. That means all, all of our heart. If you read it a little bit further, my whole heart needs to love him. My whole heart, not 99.9%, but my 100%. In fact, just go ahead and give him 110% that my whole heart needs to know him and love him. Otherwise, I'm divided. Even if it's 0.0000001, it's still a division, isn't it? says in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So we can see where our faith is, right? Our faith should be in the Lord, right? Fourth thing I want to talk about is the consequences. The consequences of a double-mindedness are grave. First, it hinders our ability to hear from God clearly. James 1, 6 through 7. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the, from the Lord. Do you see? It hinders. Doubt and indecision prevent us from receiving God's guidance and wisdom, leaving us adrift in a sea of confusion. Second thing about the consequences is a double-mindedness breeds instability and inconsistency in our lives. We become unreliable and unpredictable. When we are double-minded, our faith becomes weak and inconsistent. That means we have unstable faith, right? That means when something goes wrong at work, oh, I, I'm, I'm busted and broken, right? When a relationship goes bad, oh, that's just the end. I can't live without her. We were dating for an hour and a half and I can't live without her. 
We laugh, but I've had that. I bet you if we were real, I bet we've all been there sometime or another, right? That, that supernatural joke of a love, right? We just thought we were all in love, right? She walked back to turn her test in at school. Oh, my goodness, she loves me. I love her. And, oh, yeah, uh-huh. And we're all busted because, you know what? Who had her faith? She did. Or he did, not God. If you're single, let me give you some words of advice. Put your faith in God. Let him fill every void, and he'll bring the spouse that you need, and it'll be a godly spouse. If you go and try to find the spouse, it will be what you find, and it's not going to be of God. Let me just tell you. Been there, tried it. Our relationships suffer, and our witnesses as followers of Christ is compromised. Right? Not only that, our prayer life is ineffective. That's the consequences. I want to talk about the path to healing. So how can we overcome double-mindedness? Are you asking? Are you asking? Because we can close now. Is that an amen? Because I, 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 I want it too, right? I don't want to walk a life being double-minded. I want to have faith. If it's the size of a mustard seed, I want all that mustard seed after God. If it's a tree of refuge, I want the whole tree after God. Amen? If you don't want your blessings, just let me know, and I will make sure God gets the new address to back it up right here and unload the blessings. Amen? So how do we? Are you ready for the reminder? It says in James 4, 8, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Right? It's really that simple, right? It's so simple, but yet we do not do it. Draw near to me, cleanse your hands, and purify your heart, you double-minded. That's why he was saying it, because you guys need to clean your heart. You know, I'm not saying you guys, that, that's what James is saying, right? He's saying it to me. Hey, you double-minded, you, you're double-minded. You say you trust God, but then you don't fully trust him in areas. You say that, you know what, you, you trust God, but then you worry still. You, you say that you're, you're, you're a Christian, but then you, you, you spout off with a little bit of anger that, you know, maybe not a little bit if you ask my wife. But you know what, I mean, because I'm talking to humanity. I'm not just talking to an individual, I'm talking to humanity. Anger rises up, something comes out of my mouth that shouldn't, I respond how I shouldn't, I'm fighting with the wife, I'm fighting with the dog, and you know, I, whatever the case might be, you just nothing seems to go good because we're, we're, we're double-minded, right? Draw near to God, cleanse your hands, purify your heart. Purify your heart. Let the word dictate what's in your heart. Let the word dictate what comes out of your heart. Out of the abundance of the mouth, what? I mean, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? What's the hand speaking? What's the mouth speaking? Because the hands speak too. Are they clean? Are they committed to the Lord? Because that's the whole key. We must seek God's forgiveness, repent of our divided loyalties, and surrender ourselves fully to him. We need to cultivate a single-minded faith, which is in him. That means we have to prior prioritize our relationship with God above all else. That means we need to see, does God have, have me all? Or does, does part of my spouse? Or, or does my children? Too many times it's easy as moms and dads that we put faith in our children. Oh, he's going to get to the NBA and I'll be taking care of That's my retirement plan. Really? Well, God will make sure he takes that away if, if that's an idol. Right? We must immerse ourselves in his word, spend time in prayer, and seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit in all our decisions. As we align our thoughts, desires, and actions with God's will, we will experience the stability, peace, and joy that come from a single-minded devotion to him. Our trust in God, not our worry, stress, doubt, our waves in the wind, right? So we know how. It says in Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. But will we if we're double-minded? We know what to do. 
So the real question is that I'm going to leave with you, that I want you to ponder and think on this whole week. Why aren't we? What's stopping us? Is it because we're putting our trust in something that shouldn't be? Why am I not giving it all to the Lord? Is it because I don't believe in the Lord? Well, ponder that. Look at creation. See how it points back to God. The sovereignty of God. But why aren't we? If it just, we could have our, a prayer life. We could read the word. What, what's stopping us? Pastor, you don't understand how busy my life is. Well, I can give you my schedule too. We can compare if that's what helps you. I, I don't think comparing is very good because we're all busy, right? But if we know we need to draw near to him and drawing near to him, he's going to help us clean, clean these hands, right? He's going he's to help us purify our heart. So why aren't we? Why aren't we? Why, why am I not adjusting my schedule? I'm here to tell you, if you have a problem sleeping, then when you, you, you have, have a problem sleeping, you can't sleep, get with God. You know what? You can ask for a good sleep. It's, it's scripture. It's, there, there's a scripture that says, you know what, Lord, help me with my sleep. Give me good sleep. Maybe you're not asking. Maybe you're not spending time with him. It's amazing that whenever I have some long days and I get two hours worth of sleep, that it's sometimes, I, I can go like the Energizer Bunny and it's all because of God, because I put him first. And the days I don't put him first, I can tell. It's like I can, I'm completely out of energy. I, I'm completely frustrated. I, I'm just, you know, I'm done with the day. I don't want no calls. Right? Have you ever answered the phone frustrated? Yeah, people know you're not hiding anything. Why do you want now? With your mom. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, mom. Because you always got to apologize. You can never be mad at your mom, right? But what's keeping us? That's just the question. What's stopping you? Because I have to ask the same. What's stopping me? 15 minutes early in the morning, 15 minutes at night. You've always heard me say, Is God on your calendar? Well, why would I put God on my calendar? Well, because you always put important things on your calendar, right? It is amazing how you put your vacation down on your calendar or your planner or your to-do list, whatever. It's important, right? Well, I got vacation coming up and God knows I ain't going to be at work. In fact, I'm going to try to work the first four hours of Friday to get out of last Friday and hopefully they don't see me. Or the anniversary, your birthday, holidays. It's important. If God's not there, are those dates more important? Why isn't God? If God's so important, why isn't he on your calendar? Why isn't your alarm on your phone to make sure that you get up at 5 a.m. just to spend 15, 20 minutes with him, some prayer time with him? If he's that important, right? Just a question. Great question, right? We need to stop being double-minded because what does Jesus say? If you love me, follow my commandments, right? That means if you love me, follow me. And what do I do? I, I, I get away and I spend time with the Father. I make sure I pray. He didn't need to read the word because he was the word. But what are we doing? And to say that I love you, Jesus, and you're my Lord and Savior, but I'm not following him in every area is double-minded. Each and every one of us have a purpose and a plan. And each and every one of us have a gift of God. Each and every one of us, we are unique. We are made for God's glory. And not to walk into that purpose and fulfill that plan that he has for us. I'll let you fill in the blank. Every head bowed. I hope that you enjoyed the message today and I hope that you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you have not and you would like to right now, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness of your sins and receive Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior and you are saved and set apart. That's all it is. 
And I want you to email me. I want you to email me so I can be praying with you, that I can be believing with you, that we can equip you, that we can stay in contact with you because I want to welcome you to the family. And while you're here watching right now, make sure you check us out at Peak Worship and make sure you get involved with all of our social medias. That means you like us, you follow us, check everything out about us so you can get plugged in. Amen. And we will see you next time.